Okay, 801, I always start at 801, and so we're gonna go ahead, I think um, people are just filing in a little late today. I think it's just because it's too darn cold. So, uh, you know, my medical, my uh, weather statistic for the day, I've had nothing super positive these few weeks. We have had the most snow in the month of October that we have ever had. So that, that's the weather fact for this Friday morning. So thank you again for attending Grand Rounds and taking an hour of your time uh, to take care of yourself and learn more about medicine. So with that today, I am really incredibly honored uh, to have a very ex distinguished speaker today, uh, Dr. Christine Sinsky, MD, FACP. She's uh, talked on campus very frequently, but we have never had her here for a Medicine Grand Rounds. She is the Vice President of Professional Satisfaction at the American Medical Association, and her talk today is going to be titled, and they are going to stop I'm hammering in a little bit, uh, Creating a Manageable Cockpit for Clinicians, a Shared Responsibility. Dr. Sinsky, um, as you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about her like I do everyone else. Uh, she has been a thought area in the area of the joy of medicine and transforming prim primary care practices for many years. She's an expert in, uh, in, in, in burnout and wellness and practice redesign and really was the primary investigator of a program in search of the joy of practice uh, for primary care through the American Board of Internal Medicine. She went to medical school right here with us in Madison at University of Wisconsin. She did her residency at Gunderson Medical Foundation in La Crosse where she was a chief resident. And she is a practicing physician today as a general internist practicing at the Medical Associates Clinic and Health Plans. She has down here through December of 2019, so she might be stopping practice this year. Um, so, and then she's the Vice President uh, for Professional Satisfaction at the American Medical Association. In looking through her CV, her journey uh, to help physicians find joy in practice, especially in primary care, really started at the very beginning of her career. She now holds many incredibly prestigious positions. She's on the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Clinical Burnout. She's a New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst Thought Leader. She is currently the chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation Board of Trustees. And she has, is, sits on the courses of the most prominent uh, wellness uh, schools in the country, including she has been on the course faculty for the Stanford Chief Wellness Officer course, which happens out in California, that Dr. Mariah Quinn, our wellness officer for our department, uh, went to this year. She has received several honors. I'm just gonna mention two of these. She was the ACP Iowa Laureate Award winner in 2013, and she has received the American College of Physicians Quality Improvement Champion Award in 2016. She is really from the Midwest. She's really um, one of us, and I'm so happy she's willing to come and talk to us today. Dr. Sinsky. Thanks, Betsy. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, pleasure to be in Madison. I live just a about 40 miles north of here now. Um, and walking into the VA, I realized it was 40 years ago this month that I believe I had my first VA rotation as a third year student. And I could almost feel some of the same um, sort of anticipation and anxiety that I had uh, those days. So my pleasure to be here talking with you about creating a manageable cockpit for clinicians, a, a shared responsibility, no disclosures. We've got some learning objectives there. Um, but I want to start by saying, Houston, we have a problem here. I want you to imagine that you are a CEO of one of the many businesses in Madison. Doesn't need to be in healthcare. And if one of your leaders came to you and said, we have a condition that's in fact affecting about half of our workforce, that's impacting the quality of our product, the financial viability of our organization, the retention of our workforce, you would put your top team on that problem and you would put that as your number one priority for your organization. And that's the situation we are in in US healthcare and that is likely the situation that you are in at UW. 
So for the next few moments, we'll be talking about um, creating a manageable cockpit. We'll be talking about professional fulfillment and burnout. And we'll do some introductory thoughts. I'll go through some of the science that's around this to these topics. And I want to warn you, we're going to go dark before we go light again. So hang in there. Um, we'll talk about the business case for taking these issues seriously. And I will tell you that joy in medicine is a business imperative. And we'll talk about solutions. And one of the sets of solutions that I'll highlight for you is a series of digital uh, toolkits that we've made available from the AMA for free called Steps Forward. Currently have over 50 toolkits. You don't need to be an AMA member. You don't need a username or password. You can just go to stepsforward.org and find those resources. We'll talk about some regulatory myths and pain points, and then I've left time for questions and discussion. There are a couple of takeaways, though, that I'd like to leave you with. The first is that care of the patient requires care of the care team. That the way we'll get to the triple aim of better care for individuals, better health for the population at lower cost, is to consider the fourth aim of professional well-being. In fact, in my view, that's the shortcut to all the other objectives that an institution or that the health system has, is to dwell on the professionalism and to pull out on the professionalism of the workforce. The other takeaway that I'd like to leave you with is a notion I've been thinking about quite a bit the last couple of years. And that is, I believe that over the course of my career, we have moved to a very transactional notion of what healthcare is. And all of our infrastructures are built on this understanding that healthcare is a series of transactions. So our technology is built on that, our staffing models are built on that notion. But I believe, in fact, that at its core, our profession, our business, is relational. And that it is in our relationships that we get the gold that we are after. I'm a better diagnostician if I know my patients well. My patients are more adherent to the therapies if I know the patient well, if the patient and I have trust in each other. So I think it's time for us to rebalance this transactional conceptualization of healthcare with an understanding of the critical importance of relationship. Okay, so what is going on? We know that nearly half of all US physicians are exhibiting some sign of burnout. And that burnout rate, we've been um, monitoring it in a series of studies every three years. We do this at the AMA in collaboration with Mayo and Stanford. And it was about 45% in 2011, bumped up to 54% in 2014. And when we last studied it, it had dropped down again to about 44%. But the bigger point is that it's way too high and it's much higher than the general population, which you can see here, and at times almost double the general population. And this is despite the fact that medical students start medical school with a stronger mental health profile than the general population. So something happens in the course of medical training and practice that takes this exceptionally resilient population and leads to these extraordinarily high levels of burnout. Now, I also want to bring up our colleagues in nursing. So it turns out that burnout among nurses is the same as the general population. What nurses experience is a much higher rate of work-life uh, dissatisfaction, work-life balance dissatisfaction. So why do we care about burnout? Well, first of all, when we're burned out, it affects our patient care. We're twice as likely to make mistakes. Our patients are less adherent to our treatment recommendations. We show less empathy to our patients, and our patients recognize this, and they are less satisfied with our care. In fact, the rates of unsolicited, excuse me, the rates of complaints um, for physicians who are burned out are twice as high as the rates of complaints for physicians who are not burned out. We also care about this because we care about individuals and it's burnout infects, affects clinicians. Uh, more disruptive behavior, more divorce, more death um, from 
uh, multiple causes, but including, and most seriously, death by suicide. Burnout is also expensive for organizations. When we're burned out, we have a higher risk of malpractice. We're much more likely to go to part-time. In fact, if you charted part-time over the last few years, there's really been a huge increase in part-time. For every one point increase in burnout on a seven point scale for emotional exhaustion, there's a 43% increased likelihood that one is going to cut back to part-time in the next two years. Physician turnover is uh, also predicted by burnout. Longitudinal studies at Cleveland Clinic and at Mayo have each shown the same thing. That is, if you measure physicians here, those who are burned out two years later are twice as likely to have left that organization. And we're less productive when we're burned out. So what does this cost? Well, we did a study in conjunction with uh, Stanford and Mayo and an economist at the Harvard Business School. We were able to estimate very conservatively that physician burnout is costing the US healthcare system $4.6 billion a year. At an individual institutional level, it's about $7,000, almost $8,000 per physician per year for burnout. And that's only considering the cost of turnover and the cost of reducing clinical effort. It does not include the cost of malpractice, the cost of patient dissatisfaction, the cost of medical errors. So if nearly half of US physicians are exhibiting some sign of burnout, then we have to conclude that the problem is in the external environment, in the care delivery model itself, rather than reflecting a weakness on the part of individual physicians. In fact, it's my observation that about 80% of burnout is driven by systems factors, and only about 20% is related to individual factors. So if we want to address burnout, we have to focus on fixing the workplace rather than fixing the worker. When we start our conversation about burnout by talking about yoga and mindfulness, as important as those things are, we are telling individuals that it's their fault. And in fact, it's an environmental issue. So what's going on in that environment? This is a study we did um, in conjunction with some researchers at Dartmouth. And we looked, we trained medical students to do time motion observation. And we looked at 57 physicians um, four specialties, cardiology, orthopedics, family medicine, internal medicine, across um, four states and seven different EHRs. And what we found was that among those physicians, fully 50% of the workday was spent on the EHR and desk work. Said another way, for every one hour of direct face-to-face -face time these physicians had with their patients, they were spending an additional two hours on EHR and desk work. Now, despite spending the majority of their day or nearly the majority of their day on the EHR during the day, these physicians also reported taking one to two hours of EHR work at home every night, work that's been called pajama time. So right here in UW, another study was done with similar results. This was looking at back-end data at the timestamp data from Epic, and it was 142 physicians over uh, three years in family medicine and fully 50% of the workday was on the EHR. If you look at this, four out of those six hours were spent on activities that I would posit do not require a medical school education. Order entry, billing, coding, documentation, refills. Most of that can be done by a well-trained team. This is a graph from that study, and I'd like you to focus on the orange line. And this shows, um, amount of time on the EHR, and then this is hours of the day. And orange is the weekend, and you can see there's a peak in EHR activity uh, on Saturday night. And so I've called that date night, and suggested that date night belongs to our EHRs. And yet, for my own personal care, for the well-being of the country, I want our doctors to be doing something restorative on Saturday night, and not to be doing their catch-up work on the electronic health record. This is a study we did uh, uh, with Mayo and Stanford. We looked at um, the relationship between clerical burden and burnout. And what we found was, 
by and large, physicians are pretty, pretty dissatisfied with their electronic health records. But it's not so much the whole electronic health record, it is specifically CPOE. It is order entry that is the biggest uh, source of clerical burden for physicians and the biggest driver of burnout. So why CPOE? I want to show you a study that came out of um, Michigan and it looks at cognitive workload. And in this study, every line, every horizontal line is a different individual, a different physician. And then every color switch, every color change is a task switch. So it gives you an idea of the amount of mental switching that's going on. And this was in their organization pre-CPOE. And here it is post-CPOE. And look at the difference in the number of interruptions. I sit in the past, would sit in the emergency room admitting a patient, and I would be thinking about things I wanted to admit, and I would have to park them off to the side so that I could go through the rational thought process, or I'd have to write them down. There's so many interruptions in our cognitive workflow in our technological <coughs> environment, the way most EHRs are constructed. This is a study that we did, and just, um, had a poster presentation on it. It's been accepted for publication on the cognitive workload and its effect on burnout. And basically what we did was we had individuals identify their uh, workload using the NASA tax, the NASA tax load index. And physicians who were in the top quintile for cognitive workload had almost four times the rate of burnout that physicians who were in the lowest quintile for cognitive workload. So cognitive workload is associated with a higher rate of burnout. And I would call that structural iatrogenesis, when our infrastructures make it harder for us to do our work rather than easier. So with that as some background, I'd like to flip now to the conversation about solutions. And here we know from uh, Dr. Mark Linzer, who had previously been here at UW, that workflow and leadership are the two most powerful domains of intervention to reduce burnout. So uh, workflow, odds ratio of six of reducing burnout or improving fulfillment. Leadership changes, odds ratio of four of improving fulfillment. So we'll talk about a few examples of each of those. And I'd like to uh, also introduce to you the uh, Stanford WellMD model for burnout because I think it's, it's simple and it helps us understand uh, the different elements of the solutions. And so you can see in this model, um, if I can make my pointer, here we go, culture of wellness, efficiency of practice, and personal resilience. And the, these two are in the same color just because those are part of the external environment. They asked me to be part of uh, this, and I, I, my suggestion was to make this a much smaller quadrant because I think it's a smaller percentage, but it looks a little bit more symmetric and pleasing in, in this way. Um, so our solutions, we'll be talking primarily in the efficiency of practice domain. And I will make this statement. Uh, it's a bold statement, but I think it's not an, un, an, not an overestimate. And that is most physicians in most specialties and in most settings can save three to five hours a day by redesigning the way the work is done and by more strategically delegating the work to a higher trained staff. And so here are some examples that come out of the ambulatory setting with some time estimates that we have either from observation or from some existing data about places that you can save time. And I'll go through a couple of those here. The first is to flip the clinic. The standard way that we approach patient care is the patient comes for an appointment, then we send them for their lab, and then over the next few days, those results trickle into our inbox, and then we communicate with the patient over the portal. But we don't necessarily have all the patient's details in our minds at that moment, and we certainly don't have the patient present to engage them in their own management at that time. If we do the opposite, if we have the patients come for the labs ahead of their appointment, and we talk about current results at the appointment, then the patient can be more engaged in their care, and we can close the loop of care at their appointment. 
and not have all that loose ends and not have that volume of inbox work to manage. So at um, the Mass General, they instituted a pre-visit lab. They did that theirs with point of care testing. And they found that by doing that, they significantly reduced the number of letters and phone calls and additional visits that were required to manage those lab results. They significantly increased the amount of patient satisfaction and they saved $26 of overhead cost per visit. Now, when you consider what you're paid for an outpatient level three or level four visit, $26 is a pretty substantial component of that. And you might wonder, how is that possible? Until so you think about the experience, at least that I've had, of sitting in a call center and watching the calls come in from patients and they're asking about their results. And then that call goes from the call center to the clinical team. And from the clinical team, it goes through a message to the physician who then has to look things up and send it back and send it back and eventually gets back to the patient. And that's a lot of touch. And all that touch is expensive. So the idea that we adopted, and I uh, took this actually from ThetaCare, the, the, the motto, the next appointment starts today. That at the conclusion of today's appointment, we begin planning the next appointment. And I've done that in my practice since 1988. One year into my practice, I realized we had to get control over this lab thing that was really out of hand. And I realized that if we pre-scheduled all the predictable lab, all the prevention lab and the chronic illness lab, that we could address it at one time and I could look at all results once, just in time while I was the patient, with the patient. So second way that we can save some of that time is by going upstream on our prescription management. When I started into practice, I did what the people before me had done. I wrote number 30 and a couple of refills. I didn't know, um, but I realized after a while that we were trying to use the prescription as a hook or as an enforcer to bring patients back for their appointment, and that was an expensive way to do that. And so that if we'd made the prescriptions 90 days plus four refills, that gave us a 15-month window so the patients would come in for their appointments as we scheduled them, as they were needed, every three months or every six months, and as they needed for any acute issues. But we only had to touch the work of prescription renewal for stable prescriptions once a year. Well, that saves about 30 minutes of physician time and about 60 minutes of nursing time per physician per day. In fact, one of the things I observed in, in visiting around the country and visiting various practices is one of, the, one of the very constants is that for every group of six to eight physicians, there's typically one nurse who does almost nothing but pres prescription renewal work all day. First of all, that's not a very rewarding um, position. Secondly, it's not a good use of that nursing resource. And thirdly, it's just wasteful that it's work that does not need to be done. We can re-engineer that out of the system. If we convert that into primary care visits, that's a capacity for 40 million primary care visits that we are currently wasting simply by the way we haven't attended to a systematic approach to prescriptions. So then let's talk about uh, team documentation. This is Dr. Kevin Hopkins at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a family physician who three years into his practice was considering leaving medicine altogether. His family has a business in horticulture and he was thinking of exiting uh, to join the family business. And he decided that he'd give it another go and what he did was he, instead of working with one MA, he got permission to work with two MAs per, uh, per physician. And that MA stays with the patient from the beginning to the end of the appointment, is with him while he's in the room, and is doing visit note documentation and order entry in real time while he is able to give his undivided attention to the patient. So in that new model, he had predicted he'd need to see two more patients a day to cover the cost of that additional medical assistant. At the end of a year, he was seeing seven more patients a day. His revenue had increased by 30%. And so he was asked to spread that to others. That is a very standard economic basis that we are finding in many, many sites. Two more patients a day to cover the cost of the additional MA, 
three or four more patients a day to cover the cost of an additional nurse. In my own practice, we had 2.5 nurses per physician. That came out of my own salary. It came out of my own productivity. That was great. It was well worth it. We made out better in the long run for that investment in the infrastructure. At the Cleveland Clinic, they found that um, physicians who were in this model of advanced team-based care with in-room support had significantly more face-to-face -face time with their patients, and the quality of their documentation was as good or better than when done uh, by the physician alone. This is in Bellin Health in Green Bay. This is Dr. Jim Jerzak. They are doing that with all 100 of their family physicians, and they're in the course of spreading it to uh, the total of 150 physicians in their multi-specialty clinic. And you can see he's able to give his undivided attention to the patient while the assistant is doing all of the data entry and data retrieval. If he needed to know something, and I've, I've had a chance to shadow Jim, uh, he's also an alumni from UW, uh, had a chance to shadow him, and um, he'll ask, you know, what was the last creatinine, what did the last CT scan show, and the medical assistant can pull that up for him while he can stay focused on the patient. When I was there, one of the patients who he was seeing that morning said, and I was talking to her out in the hallway, and she said, you know what's really different in this model? She says, now I get my doctor back. Now I get him all to myself. And I think that that's the patient side of the experience that I've had as a physician. Now I can give my direct attention to the patient. So at Green Bay, they're part of the next-gen ACO um, pilot. And what they found in that is that they had improvement in their key performance measures. They've uh, found improvement in patient likelihood of, of recommending. They saved $27 per member per month for those physicians, patients who were cared for by physicians in that model. And they also got $724 more revenue per patient per year because they had more immunizations, more cancer screening, more um, mammograms, et cetera. This is a variation on that theme. This is at UCLA. And this is Dr. David Rubin's work. Um, they have trained what they call physician partners. They are non-clinically trained individuals who shadow the physician and do the documentation in real time. What they found there was they saved three hours of physician time per day. They saved an hour and a half of physician time per session even though patient satisfaction with the amount of time they had with their physicians increased in this model. And that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine a number of years ago. Uh, this is at the University of Utah in Redstone. Uh, this is Dr. Mary Parsons, an internist there. And when I visited her and I took this picture, what I liked about it is, again, you can see her giving her undivided attention to her patient, while one of the medical assistants is doing the important work of data entry. They have a two and a half medical assistant per physician ratio in this model. They found that their quality measures went up, their efficiency went up, and their satisfaction for patient staff and um, physicians all went up. They found cycle time went from 90 minutes to 45 minutes. So cycle time being check-in time to check-out time. The most interesting thing that they published was that they found that their overhead costs went down. So you have to invest in some staff infrastructure to have productivity. So as they invested in more staff, their overhead went down. And that only makes sense. I think there are very few other industries where it would be considered a good business model to have your highest trained, potentially most expensive employees doing work that other employees could be doing. And yet we do that every single day uh, in healthcare. So this is at the University of Colorado in their family medicine department, and this is a model that they've um, developed. They call it their APEX model, and it's in their residency program. So in first year, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for residents. By their third year, it's a two-to-one ratio with in-room support. So at the same time that the residents were exposed to this model, the faculty were also provided this model, and their burnout rates dropped from 53% to 13% in one year. The faculty were not required to increase their capacity, but they did, in fact, increase the number of patients seen 
spontaneously by three and a half patients per day. So it's not just internal medicine, it's not just family medicine. Uh, many other specialties uh, also have in-room support in this way. But it's also in hospitalist programs. So I had the chance to speak with the head of the hospitalist program at Abbott Northwestern, where they had a crisis in 2013 and about 20% of their hospitalists left. And they realized they were going to have to do something different themselves. The hospitalists left because of the workload. So they hired um, what they called scribes. It's a term I don't tend to use because it has some medieval connotations. Um, but they hired these documentation assistants to help. And so for admitting shifts, they have a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and for rounding shifts, they have one documentarian per two physicians. And uh, although they haven't published data, uh, what that director of their hospitalist program has told me is that he feels that he is saving several hours of time uh, per day and feels that he is doing better work uh, because of the assistance here. So I'd like to switch now and think about solutions for taming the inbox. Because certainly one of the commonalities that I also know is that across the country, across settings and specialties, the inbox has become that Sisyphusian task, that we never feel like we can get to the bottom of it. And I will tell you that I know I have an inbox. I think I can get to it. I never, ever, 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 ever go there. My nurses are the ones who are responsible for the inbox. They will review all the messages that come into the inbox, all the labs that come in, they will research that, they will bring those research me messages to me, and I can then, with them, go over those messages in a matter of moments, rather than the hour or more it would take to do that same work. And I would posit that those messages get better attention because the nurse is able to spend the time to investigate the background behind that. If we have a potassium that's 3.1, she will look and see what the previous potassiums were. She will look and see what the medications are. She may call the patient to find out what's going on. She may call the pharmacist to find out if they've been filling all of their medications. And only after all of that research does she come to me with that kind of um, message. And so that's, I think, a much safer model than we were looking at it, we're trying to remember who they are, we might spend some time on it, and we never can get to the bottom of the box. So at Fairview Clinic in Minneapolis, they have um, empowered their nurses and medical assistants to filter the inbox. So instead of designing the system with the physician being the first responder to all the incoming into the practice, the clinical support staff is the first responder. And they pass on to the physician only that minority of message that requires the physician level of engagement. At Fairview, they've been able to reduce what they call the backpack of work, the work the physician takes home every night, from 90 minutes to just a few minutes uh, by doing this. This is from the president and CEO of Sutter Gold, a large system in California. They found that um, in their organization, Physicians who had more than 100 <laughs> inbox messages a week had twice the rate of burnout as their physicians who had less than that. The average primary care physician has almost 100 inbox messages a day. So this is work that comes uh, out of UCSD uh, in California. It was just published recently in Health Affairs showing that in internists and family physicians have over 400 inbox messages a week. Uh, half of these are generated by system algorithm. They're just those alerts. Um, uh, many would consider them nuisance reminders. Um, primary care had two and a half times as men many messages as surgery, four times that of their colleagues in non-procedural um, cognitive specialties, and five times that of their um, non-surgical proceduralists. Uh, tap and go. This is from uh, your neighbors across town. Dean Clinic instituted tap and go and found that they save 17 minutes a day. They dropped the number of inbox sign-ins from 102 sign-ins a day to just two sign-ins a day. 
About 20 of those they reported were misfires, the ones where you made a typo, which seemed to really kind of drain your energy. Um, and you might say 17 minutes a day, big deal, but I say, I call those happiness minutes, and we need to give back as many happiness minutes as we can. Yale in their emergency room found that they save 45 minutes a day. Being seated in flow stations, being seated side by side with whoever is your right hand person or people. Uh, Health Partners in Minneapolis finds it that that saves 30 minutes a day. You can just answer those messages right at the time rather than sending those email messages that go round and round and round and round. Printer in every room. I've certainly been in many situations where I've seen the physician type up the after visit summary when we can ask separately why is that a physician responsibility, but then hit print, run down the hall, around the corner, down the hall again to the one printer in the unit, pick up the after visit summary, round the down the hall, around the corner, and back. In the meantime, they've broken their bond with the patient, and they've likely been interrupted a time or two on the way to that printer. That is a very hazardous environment. Health Partners finds that having a printer in every room saves 20 minutes a day. Um, I pulled this in. This is uh, about relationships and how they matter. This comes from Family Medicine right here at UW. Um, where they found that the density of the electronic health record communication predicted poor clinical outcomes. The more face-to-face -face communication there, was, there is, the higher the uh, rates of control of LDL and blood pressure, and frequent, uh, excuse me, less frequent hospitalization, urgent care visits, ER visits, saving approximately $600 per patient per year. Relationships really do matter. So we've talked some about workflow and about teamwork. Let's talk briefly about uh, leadership. We know that from work at Mayo Clinic that we can explain 11% of the variation in burnout and 47% of the variation in physician satisfaction by the leadership score of their immediate physician leader. It's a cliche that pay, people don't leave their jobs, they leave their bosses. I think in medicine we have an opportunity to improve the quality of our leadership and to understand the quality of our leadership. This is a simple survey that Mayo has created and has made available to others um, that is asked of the physician populate workforce about their immediate leader. And it's asking, are they empowering me to do my job, interested in my opinion, hold career development decisions with me, uh, and keep me informed, et cetera. And um, so they basically address these components of the leader index. Am I included? Am I informed? Am I in uh, do they inquire about my uh, ideas? Do they help develop me? And do they help recognize uh, my good work? And um, I have been at one organization where the chair of the department asked the division chiefs to report back to the physicians that they led the results of the leadership score and the areas that uh, needed improvement and ask their physicians for feedback and for help in doing a better job. And I think that takes tremendous courage but imagine the change in the culture if we have that kind of uh, open feedback going on. Here's another change in culture. This is Dr. Steve Strongwater. He is the CEO of Atrius Health in the Boston area. And when he came to Atrius, he brought with him Joy in Medicine as his leadership structure. And he had four different domains for Joy in Medicine. And he asked his board to hold him responsible for the professional fulfillment scores of his physicians. In turn, he asked his executive leadership to be responsible for the, leader, for the well-being scores of the people of, of the workforce. And imagine when the head of IT, when the head of compliance, when the head of all of the different departments within an organization are collectively responsible for the well-being scores of that organization. Instead of being able to make a siloed decision, it causes leaders to have to think more broadly 
about what's the impact of my decision on the people who are doing the work. So at Atris, what that did is it led the tech, the IT people, to realize that they had to consider the impact of IT on the well-being of the workforce. And so they created an HIT SWAT team, which created an HIT bundle, and they went to every single unit, and they watched and observed and listened, and they determined ways that they could make the IT better fit to the workflow and the needs of the clinicians in those units. By doing this, they've uh, been able to reduce uh, the number of clicks in Atrius. They estimate by a million clicks a day. They believe they've been able to reduce the inbox volume by about 30% per day. Uh, here's another leader I wanted to highlight. This is Dr. Alexa Kimball. She's the CEO of the Physicians Group at Beth Israel in Boston. And um, they've worked with us at the AMA because we deploy uh, one of the burnout surveys actually designed by Dr. Linzer, who had been here. Um, and they asked us if we could add 25 additional questions to that. And what Dr. Kimball did was she asked her executive leadership team to come up with 25 things that they could do that they thought would improve the work lives of their physicians. They couldn't do all 25. They thought they probably could do 10 of those. So they listed all 25 on this burnout survey. And the physicians were able to then give input into which of those 25 were um, going to be addressed and give input into the 10 that were chosen. What they found after 18 months was that their burnout rate, because we've done a longitudinal set of uh, burnout assessment for them, burnout rates dropped by 20%. This is Dr. Kimball as she's uh, receiving the uh, joy in medicine uh, recognition. And I want to briefly let you know about that. So at the AMA, we piloted in 2019 um, a joy and recognition program. And we have six domains, commitment, assessment, leadership, efficiency of practice, teamwork, and support, three different levels of achievement. We invited 35 health systems to apply, 22 did. And so we were able to recognize those health systems, including Beth Israel, um, just a month ago at the American Conference on Physician Health. We will be opening that up to all institutions after the first of the year. And we recognize and uh, we, we had hoped and we have learned that it in fact is doing this, that it will serve as a roadmap for organizational leaders who want to assess where are we with respect to workforce well-being and what should we be thinking of? Where can we focus our efforts? Another example of leadership here, many of you may have seen this article in the New England Journal, Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff. I think it's an, uh, a brilliant title. We can all relate to that. This is Dr. Melinda Ashton. Um, at, in Hawaii. I had the chance to interview her um, and they just put out a call to their physicians and nurses and other workforce. What are the things you're doing that are stupid that we can get rid of? They were focused on technology and they were, able, for example, able to eliminate 10 of the 12 most common alerts. My favorite example was a pediatric nurse asked, you know, why are we really required to document the cord care condition for our adolescents. So there was a screen for newborn cord care, but that question was on all pediatric patients, including adolescents, and it had been for years. And, and her question and mine is, really, why did it take so long for someone to raise this up? So Cleveland Clinic called up um, Hawaii and said, hey, can we model after what you're doing? And they said, said sure, and they shared some of the ideas. Um, and I had the chance to visit with them at Cleveland Clinic, within three weeks, they had 400 suggestions of similar sorts of things, clicks and steps that seemed unnecessary or without value that they were able then to uh, begin to work on. Before we wrap it up, a couple of additional things. We have a page on the AMA website called Debunking uh, Regulatory Myths. I know that much of the pain that physicians experience may start with federal regulation, but it is exacerbated by over It's enabled by our technology, but it's exacerbated by over-interpretation of those policies at the local level, out of an abundance of caution, and out of that siloed responsibility. So we have uh, four up there now, um, three that I've shown in this slide, but one is on CPOE. It's no longer part of any Medicare 
um, EHR incentive program that physicians be the ones physically typing the orders. Medical students and ancillary staff can document, for example, HPI or parts of the exam. The physician has to do those things, but if the medical student and or other staff have documented what the physician has done, the physician does not need to re-document. So in the case of a student, the physician would need to read, determine the history and redo the exam, but would not need to re-document those pieces for it to count for billing. And we link then to the appropriate sites in the CMS or the Joint Commission's webpage uh, from, from the debunking regulatory myths page. And then here's a note from the Joint Commission. We met with them a, about two years ago. They spent a year studying team-based care, came to my practice, went to Dr. Hopkins' practice, and they have updated their policies to be in closer alignment with the needs of team-based care, indicating that any uh, personnel doing documentation assistance may enter orders into the EHR. So, um, briefly on steps forward, we've created uh, the 50 toolkits that I've mentioned, including one where you can put in the number of physicians in your organization, rates of burnout and turnover, conservative costs for uh, cost of, burn of turnover, which we've put in at 500,000. We know it's between 500,000 and 1.3 million for every physician who leaves, and estimate the cost. So an organization with 1,000 physicians is investing already $12 million every year in burnout. They're just investing it at the wrong end, at the end of replacing those physicians who leave because of burnout. Imagine what a fraction of that can do to uh, stem the burnout entirely. So I want to just, I would like to cl close by going back to the two takeaways. The first is that we have evolved toward a more transactional notion of care and I think we need to rebalance that with a, an explicit recognition of the importance of the relational nature of our work and that we automate and delegate much of our work so that we have time and breathing room for those relationships. And finally, we've talked about the quadruple aim and I'd like to leave you with the words um, of Dr. Catherine Lucy, who has restated the quadruple aim, I think, in a more poetic fashion. Care better than we've ever seen. Health better than we've ever known. Cost we can all afford. Delivered by professionals who find joy in their work as they commit to serve others. And that's a mission I can sign up for. Thank you so much for your attention. So when we do have time for questions or comments. In the back. Yes, uh, I want to just thank you for a brilliant lecture. Thank, thank goodness Dr. Coatbridge is here. I think every member of leadership in the hospital and the medical school should be forced to listen to this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent, I think it was three and a half, four hours filling out uh, on the computer doing the, the, these reviews and things, which I think most of us find meaningless. We end up doing, uh, I think, three or four surveys about our activities each year and sending them in. There's a lot of insane work. But if we have to do that, I think leadership has to listen to this lecture or nothing is going to change it in this health system. Well, I think you're so right that I think we've had incremental activities that were each well-intended and could even somewhat be justified in isolation, but taken in some have made an unmanageable work life. And um, I suspect that all of us have a role to play in, in that because we took calculus, we did organic chemistry, like we can do it, right? We always thought we could just do it, just one more thing, one more thing, yeah, I can do that. But actually, no, we can't. And we can't do that anymore. And so we just have to stop. And so I hope no one feels forced, but sure, I'm ha I'd be happy if, if many of your leaders... Uh, lecture, um, taped? Yes, it is. Like our grand round lectures are taped, okay? Yeah, yeah. I, I really think... CEO has to 
watch this? Uh, Dr. Kaplan does know about it, and I will definitely touch base with you afterwards. Great. <laughs> um, Steve. Thank you. Uh, just amazing uh, thoughts and uh, uh, wisdom. Um, what I'm wondering is, you know, most health systems have, you know, a lot of people who generate good ideas. And, um, and so, and you describe a number of systems that have really elevated those ideas into practice. Right. But I'm just wondering, um, from the, system, the case examples you provided, um, how, how does uh, the organization kind of harness uh, all these ideas from all over the place and then make it Right, right. So I, that's such a critical question. The question is, like, how do you take isolated individual good ideas and um, generalize them? And, and I would also say, and how do you get good ideas with balancing this notion of customization and standardization? Because I think all the things that are painful that are standardized really started from a good intention as well. And so I think we need to be thoughtful and even scientific about where on the continuum that decision is made about customization and standardization. My own bias is that the closer to the patient care we can um, put decision making about operations, the better the care will be. Um, I also hope that we can develop the science here. We spend over $100 billion a year investigating new tests and treatments, and we spend a minor fraction of that investigating the delivery model to optimally deploy those tests and treatment. And so I think we need more science. We're working on one thing at the AMA in, uh, in partnership in part with some people at UW and, and at six other centers, looking at how to leverage EHR audit log data so that we can start to see our work through a different lens and see how much time is spent on prescriptions, how much time is spent on inbox, how much time is spent on these various things, and then how do interventions that uh, are meant to impact that, how do they impact it? Or how does a, a, a compliance decision impact the time it takes to do the work at the far end? And so part of my hope is that science will, will help with the spread, and part of my hope is that shared accountability will, that when the compliance officer is responsible not just to protect the institution from an audit failure, but is to protect the well-being scores and the productivity and the other outcomes. I think we make different decisions. The answer is always no if my job is just to protect from an audit failure. But my answer may have to be yes if I also am responsible for the ability of the clinicians to do their work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what are other organizations doing or what is the research show about sort of this instant gratification? Patient results are released that day at 10 o'clock at night and if I feel like if I don't respond to it, my nurse is going to get a my chart at midnight and then if I don't respond to that by 1 a.m., the patient's going to call the clinic at 8 a.m. because they, I didn't respond to the my chart the result was released. Or same thing on the weekends, patients send a my chart Saturday at 8 a.m. If I don't get on Saturday evening, they're going to send two or three more my charts before Monday morning. What are Yes. So I don't know that I have a great solution. Just kind of oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. Um, so the question is, how do we deal with the instant gratification or the expectation that we will respond instantly to messages online? And of course, we do kind of think of every texting, what they haven't caught me back in 30 seconds. What's wrong? So we uh, export that into the patient portal uh, time frame expectation. So. Um, what I know is it's an issue for in most places, and I haven't heard people come up with totally creative ideas. My thought is we have to train ourselves. Like, if you want work-life balance, you actually have to have some discipline itself. I don't feel that we as physicians are, um, are without some responsibility for where we are. And part of that is, okay, then turn it off. Do not look at it over the weekend. Do not look at it. You should have a system in place that nothing critical is ending up there. And so whenever you're done with your clinic session, don't look at it again until your next clinic session. So uh, that would be one solution. I do think doing the labs ahead of the appointment is also another way, because if you do your lab on Tuesday, you've got an appointment to see the physician on Thursday. 
I'm less likely as a patient to call in because I know I'm going to be able to ask my questions in person. And, and so uh, that would be my own uh, approach. Those two would be my approaches. Yes. I've been practicing for 35 years. In fact, Tom was in my class. Oh, yes. Um, I, could, I could go on and on and on about this. Uh, a few observations that I have is that one, the, the electronic medical record is based upon the paper record, which keeps you flipping back and forth through various uh, uh, parts of the chart. Whereas if you had a living document that had everything as soon as you open it up, all there, just like a history and physical with all the recent labs that are always on there, and you can, you can just use that and update it every time something comes in so that the next time you look at it, bang, everything's there. So a different system will be better. With the system that we have, we have to cut down on keystrokes. My whole goal was to never do a keystroke if I could get away with that. So if you do something three times, make a template for it. You know, cold, COPD, asthma, diabetes, back pain, your routine stuff that you do all the time. So you can say, back pain, click, there it is. Erase that, done, you know. And your usual anti-inflammatory. And then if you have standardized approaches, that your nurse knows, you say, give them the back pain, the, the, the back pain uh, uh, the program, give them the, the self-care for cold program, and if they don't get better in such and such, then the, the, the. so everything is all pre-programmed. You can sit there and I, I, you can probably run it all by at your desk without ever seeing the patients. Well, so there are many ways that we are all trying to deal with how are we going to get out from under this heavy weight of of the documentation burden and the order entry burden. Um, and I think some of it is t teamwork, some of it is um, documentation shortcuts. Um, I will tell you I'm optimistic that the 2021 changes in e &M coding uh, requirements that are in the proposed rule that will drive billing only by medical decision making and not by history and not by exam will lead to less note bloat. Um, personally, I feel like if I could template it, that is if I could blow in text, it shouldn't even be documented, right? It's just too much dross to look through when you're trying to find the gold that's, that's in the note. But, but your point is we have so much waste in the way we currently go about our documentation. Um, and I think one, one improvement will be the change in the e &M coding which um, if the final, if the proposed rule is accepted, uh, that should go into effect January of 2021, at which point you can document the history that you need, but no more, the exam that you need, but no more. One last question, Dr. Sheehy. Um, one of the questions that uh, I have for you though is, uh, it seems like this is all the tail wagging the dog. I mean, uh, we had a nice talk from San Francisco General here a couple of years ago about the Boeing system improving safety of pilots. Uh, my brother has a business, but so when he went into the computerized system, his efficiency went up, not down. Uh, that has not happened with the electronic medical record. And it seems a little bit crazy to me that we have to add all these people, if you will, to make the system work without really demanding that the system change, uh, that the electronic medical record has to catch up to where we are, and it's, it doesn't seem to be. So um, I agree with you that part of the pain from the EHR has come from the multiple stakeholders who have put their objectives onto the EHR, so billing and compliance and research and um, monitoring and that sort of thing have um, have used the EHR in a way that has made it more difficult for us to use it for clinical purposes. Um, I will also say that I had dreamt of having in-room support. We went uh, eventually to two and a half nurses per physician. And what I learned was having that clinical partner in the room with me helped a little bit with the documentation, helped a lot with the order entry but it helped a lot more than I anticipated with the quality of the patient care, with 
all the things that the nurse then was able to bring to me as part of the conversation with the patient that she had known from other contacts and all the things that she took out of the room that she could then use to inform all the between visit care and all of the greater knowledge and skill that she had acquired by being in the room. So I would say that advanced models of team-based care with in-room support um, really go much beyond just a workaround around the EHR and go to wraparound care for the patient. Mm -hmm. And even if I had a perfect EHR, I would want to have that kind of team-based care because I believe I gave much better care in that model. So I want to thank you. Yeah, and we have two drop. There's a 9.30 drop in breakfast and an 11.30, Mariah, drop in lunch. Uh, that if you are interested in coming to just uh, spend some more intense time with Dr. Sinski, uh, you can do come up here afterwards, and she'll be up here for questions too. Thank you so much. Thank you.